Who controls your life? The devil or God? Day by day, that is a good question to ask and then go to the Bible to learn something about how to answer it. To Christians, the Apostle Peter wrote these words. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Maybe we should ask sometimes certain Brethren, is the devil gnawing on you? <laughs> well, he may not be gnawing on us, but I can tell you right now, he's close by, maybe waiting to pounce 24 hours a day. The truth the apostle stated in 1 Peter 5, 8 continues to be as needful and relevant, if you like that word, today, as when the Holy Spirit guided Peter to write it. Although Satan walketh about seeking whom he may devour today, and he'll do so until the end of time, our God in heaven has provided a way for us to escape his clutches. And regarding that particular fact, the inspired James wrote, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's the power that God has given every faithful child of God. Resist the devil and what will he do? He will flee from you. You might try this sometime. That's one of the ways I have of dealing with certain things because we're to keep our minds pure and that means in harmony with the word of God and our affection set on things above not on things of the earth. Well, when something crosses your mind that you know is contrary to the Bible, Christians haven't got any business thinking about, just do what Jesus or say what Jesus said to Peter. When Peter was trying to say, no, 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 you won't go up to Jerusalem and die when Peter didn't realize if he didn't, that ends Peter and everybody else is get thee behind me Satan and start thinking about those things the Bible teaches to think about and you'll be surprised how that works but remember this Satan has no power none whatsoever to possess a person unless that person permits him to do it it will not be against that person's will that Satan possesses him. Regarding Satan's manner of controlling people today, Paul the Apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote these words. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able but will with the temptation make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it first corinthians 10 13 well sometimes we don't see the way of escape but it's there when our faith is put to the test we may not see it because we don't study our Bible enough. And we don't train our lives to look for that way of escape. But it's there, and I know what the Bible says, and the Bible's true. So that way of escape can be found if we want to find it. Now today, and Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, today the devil exercises his power and it's great power. I don't suppose any of us probably appreciate 
how powerful Satan is. But he does so depending upon our cooperation. I'll say more about that later. Notice what John said to Christians long ago regarding not being a part of the way the world works. And in that way, you'll also resist the devil. He'll flee from you. In verse 15 of 1 John chapter 2, John says, love not the world. Well, I have to know what not to love. What does he mean by world? John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So how does he say not love the world? Well, it's obvious he uses the word world in two different senses. God loved everybody and gave his son to die for all. And Jesus loved all of us and came to the world to die for us. But when it comes to the world, as John uses it, that Christians are not to love, he defines it for us. What does he mean here? Well, he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the things that are in the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He goes even more to specify what he means. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride, what the American Standard 1901 says, the vain glory of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Verses 15 through 17 of 1 John 2. So today... The devil exercises his power and he influences us through these avenues, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And if those things of the flesh, of materialism, of secularism dominate us and our interest and our love, then the love of the Father is not in us. Because Jesus said to the apostles in John 14, 15, uh, if you love me, Proof of it is this, you will keep my commandments. Well, when you love gratifying the lust of the flesh, lust of the pride of life, and that's where you're centered, then you're not going to be knowing the commandments of God or keeping the commandments of God. Your love is somewhere else. I think it's interesting to note that Satan cannot influence or impact us more than we allow him to do, and let's keep that in mind. So responsibility we're keeping the line off of us who seeks to devour us is our own. And God in his word has told us how to do it. He's not left us alone. Satan went only as far as God allowed him to do, as far as his power exercised upon anybody, in this case, with Job. However, God determined that power, didn't he? He only could go so far. Read the beginning parts of Job, and you'll see that he limited the power the devil could exercise over Job. God limited the power of Satan then in his efforts to destroy Job because he would have if he could. And he said, you can't take his life. In John 19, 11, we find the response of Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor, the time that he was before him, just before his crucifixion. And Pilate asked him about, don't you know I have power to this and so? And I've always thought a lot about what Jesus answered is to the control of God over all things. Thou couldst have no power at all against me, Jesus said, except it were given thee from above. So when we see us put into the condition of human beings in a fleshly body in a world built like this with Satan seeking to devour all of us, you begin to grow in understanding the truth that we're here to prove ourselves. We're at a battleground, and we will choose God's ways. We know it in the Bible, and we'll use, as we sang about a moment ago, prayer as it's taught in the Scriptures, and every other aspect of what it is to be able to resist the devil so he'll flee from us. Now, the foregoing being noted and commented on, the Bible teaches a difference between Satan's work through people who were demon-possessed against their wills, mark that, against their wills in order to control them, 
and also the manner whereby Satan works to control men today, which we've already introduced to us as to the way Satan goes about as a lion seeking whom he may devour and how we can limit him by following the teaching of the Bible. Now let's look for a moment at the demons. You'll remember what we have of it in the scriptures that the demons are evil spirits as they're also called, sometimes devils, talked and exercised themselves. They were individual persons by controlling the man that they possessed. Now that's abundant, such as in Mark 5, 1 through 20, and Matthew 8, 28 through 24, and just read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke 8, 26 through 29, and you'll see there were then human beings who were possessed of a, an unclean spirit, a demon, against their will, and the demon controlled them while he was in that body. Well, it's interesting to note when you look at Jesus and you find John 20, 30, and 31 telling us the design and purpose of the miracles he worked to prove he was the Son of God, that we could believe in him, that in his life, in his ministry, he showed his power over nature. He showed his power over sickness. He showed his power even over governments and so forth. The ultimate power that he demonstrated is his power over death. He was resurrected from the dead. And thus all these things say this man is the Son of God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. John 14, 6. And in proving his power over evil in the world, then Jesus miraculously demonstrated his power over these evil spirits, these demons. And you notice that he casts out demons. Now, what's interesting is if you look at Luke chapter 8, here's a fellow who had a legion of demons possessing him. And Jesus chose to cast them out. I learned a little bit about something about these demons here because people always say, what is a demon? What is an evil spirit? What is an unclean spirit? Well, did you notice there that they requested of Jesus that they be allowed to go into this herd of swine? Now, the best we can ever define that I found, if you found otherwise, I'd like to know about it, of what an evil spirit is, is what the Jews believed about it, and you have to get that out of secular literature that they've written. And I think it's in harmony with the scriptures in view of Jesus coming in his earthly ministry to demonstrate his power over everything, that these were spirits of evil men let out of the Hadean world, and they were allowed to come back for a period and actually possess people. And that's what we have in the case of these demons who wanted to be cast into the bodies of the hogs. Have you ever raised the question? That tells us a little bit about these. They can't be just created originally as spirit beings because what did they want? They wanted a body. I think that begins to tell us, if we'll think about it in view of also the other matters about the human spirit and the flesh and uh, while we're here and then after we die, what happens at death, the spirit apart from the body is dead, James says. It tells us God never intended the human spirit to be without a body. Paul calls it that we're naked, 2 Corinthians 5. He just simply called the spirit without a body being naked. It never was meant to exist without a body. And these spirits, if it so be they were spirits of wicked men who were allowed to come out of the Hadean world and come back to the earth, because I know the Bible's true and it says these spirits possessed people and through them talked to Jesus and recognized who he was. That's now come to torment us before the time which they recognized there was a time coming of a final love and judgment of all men. And they requested to not just cast out into the deep, but they said, can we go into those? They recognized his authority. Notice that. They didn't say, we'll resist you and not go. When he told them to go, they went. 
And they went to where he had permitted them to go. So they went to the swine herd, and the poor old hogs couldn't handle that, and they all run to the sea and drown. Now where did they go? Well, my judgment is probably they may have gone back to the Hadean world. The New Testament records many miracles, the design of which proved Jesus to be then whom he claimed to be, the only begotten Son of God, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the God-Man, the Savior of the world, the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us, as John wrote, the only begotten of the Father. And these things were done so that we could know the Bible is the Word of God and that what it says about Jesus is true. Now, admittedly, there's much we can't know about demon possession. But we can know what the Bible reels about the same. It's in the Bible. It's real for our learning. Deuteronomy 29, 29. doesn't say we can learn a whole lot, but if it's in there, we can learn what it has revealed. Demons were personally present. I hope that's been made clear. Some people try to explain away demon activity in the person being some sort of disease or epileptic seizure or something like that. But uh, the Bible calls them what they are because he did heal folks with those diseases, but it always separates these from those diseases. They were personally present then during the days of our Lord's earthly ministry and during the work of the apostles of Christ after the church was established and uh, directly caused problems in and for the, those they personally and directly possessed. And you don't just have a, you just have a casual reading of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see that. Some of them were terrible problems. Now, it's interesting while they were here is that the Holy Spirit, God, had dispensed miraculous power to Jesus and to the apostles and others who had the laying on of the apostles' hands and thereby received certain gifts to be able to deal with these demons who possess people against their will and control them. In the Holy Spirit's miraculous control of them, another thing was accomplished as well all the miracles were designed to do, John 20, 30, 31, and that is confirm Jesus to be the Son of God, confirm the Word to be from heaven and not from man. Mark 16, 20, and Hebrews 2, verses 2 and 3. After speaking of these things, people usually, if they want to know more about it, will say, well, when, when did evil spirit possession cease? Somebody says, well, I don't think it has. I think I know several that are <laughs> demon-possessed. Well, we jokingly talk about, well, he's got his demons to fight and all that. But you'll notice today that as long as people are in their right mind, have their normal faculties, then they can either reject the gospel, accept it, or do their own thing, live contrary to what the Bible says, not even caring, or embrace all sorts of other philosophies and religious doctrines that are contrary to the truth of the New Testament. So people want to know, when, when did these demons cease to possess people? I've been around a number of folks who are of the persuasion they're still here. Certain Pentecostal holiness people believe they're of demons possession. If they were right, then you're looking at a man that's demon possessed. Because after preaching in Van Buren, Arkansas, a series of lessons on the design and purpose of miracles, I was called up by one of that persuasion and told I had a devil. I simply responded by saying, well, if I have a devil, it's him talking to you and not me. Now, do you have the power of the apostle said to cast him out? Well, certainly I do. I said, cast him out. If not, you'll be held accountable for my soul on their judgment. Click. That was the end of the conversation. So much for modern-day miracle workings and their defense. After speaking of the day of the fountain for sin, being opened in Jerusalem, God further spoke to the great prophet, saying, and I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass out of the land. Zechariah chapter 13, 2. Now, the inspired New Testament prophets continued working miracles, confirming their word to be of divine origin, until the word of God was fully revealed and written. 
Obviously, Zechariah's prophecy dealt with the time when the revelation of God's word to man would be complete. Thus, there was the need for a direct operation of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, upon the spirit of the apostles and prophets for the express purpose, the express purpose of furnishing them directly and infallibly with God's revelation to mankind. Ultimately, that's what the Holy Spirit did. Read John 14, 15, and 16 about the work of the Spirit with the apostles and their primary function. And the church knew it because they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. John 8 and verse, or rather Matthew 2, I'll get in a minute, Acts 2 and verse 42. How did the word of Christ get to this earth and get in your Bible? The Holy Spirit revealed it through the apostles and prophets. The whole Bible is written by God, regardless of the human hand that wrote it down, the mind of whom was guided infallibly by God, the Holy Spirit. God wrote the Bible. Plainly put, as Paul did, to a much quoted scripture, at least among us, all scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, which means complete, truly furnished at every good work. So the Holy Spirit confirmed their words to be of divine origin by the miracles they worked. Now, it's the coordinating conjunction A and D in Zechariah's prophecy that tells us that the presence of unclean spirit or demon possession of people against their will also came to an end when the miracles ended. Whenever the prophets passed out of the land, what else happened? According to Zechariah 13, 2. Whenever the prophets passed out of the land and God caused it, what else did he say? The unclean spirits passed out of the land. Which in God's design of thing, which we may never fully understand, there was a need for them to be here relative to the whole development of the scheme of redemption. And I can say if nothing else, so Jesus could exercise his power over them. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. So we conclude that people who were personally and directly possessed by demons against their will well, also under the demon's control, but that such demon possession ceased when the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit said through the prophet long years before Christ came into this world and the church was established concerning the cessation of miracles and demon possession long before Christ came to earth, before the church was established. Now, if we can determine when miracles ended, we can also know when demon possession ended. When we look to this verse, whatever else the Bible says, too, concerning demon possession, I think you always, as a rule of Bible study, right in the dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, keep what Zechariah said in mind, Zechariah 13.2, that both miracles and demon possession ended at the same time. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in his marvelous redemptive work solved our biggest problem. Of course, a whole host of people don't know it's their biggest problem, but it's the biggest problem which there's no bigger <laughs> on this earth for you and for me and for all mankind, and that is he solved the sin problem. Sins and transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. It is the only thing that can separate you from God. Nothing else can. People may not like your necktie. They not, may, may not like uh, how you look in your face. They may not like the house you live in. They may not like your race. They may not like anything like that. But it's only sin that will separate between you and your God. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. And death means separation from God. And a person who dies unforgiven of sins has no hope of going to heaven. But notice in dealing with the sin problem, and we've already seen 
God limited Satan's power in different situations. He limited the power of Satan to destroy us. Indeed, the devil continues to work today. That's plain from what we started with from Peter. Always seeking to destroy us. But how does he do it? By lies. That's how Satan works today. By lies. The Bible teaches he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The devil says you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Now, how does he spread those lies? Through his agents. Who are his agents? Those who reject the truth and teach what they want to do. Jesus said of those who resisted him among the Jewish leaders, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a liar from the beginning. He was a murderer. Now, how do I know if God's controlling me or Satan is controlling me? Do we believe and obey the Bible? Do we act only by the authority of Jesus Christ, who's the only avenue for us to God? Or we, do we go by other people's philosophies and views and opinions, or even our own feelings and emotions? And I've had people, I don't know if anybody's ever preached very long, that has had somebody to one extent or the other just plainly tell them, well, I just don't think that. <laughs> I just don't think, I, I don't feel that. Some people have gone so, I had one person tell me one time in a rage saying, I don't care what the Bible says. Well, as soon as that came out of that person's mouth, I decided right then, that ends it. Until you have a disposition toward God and his word, I can't do anything with you. Except live the Christian life before you and you'll just have to go ahead and deny God's word. And he'll deny you on the day of judgment. Of course, Satan's lies takes various forms. I've already mentioned false religious doctrines, false philosophies, deceitful works of all kinds. Just plain dishonesty will cause you to go into all sorts of things contrary to the Bible. And you can go on down the line, 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, and Ephesians 4, 14. We're warning God's word about allowing such things to cause us to reject what we can read in the Bible to be true. Remember this, the devil always appeals to us in his efforts to get us to sin as we read from John a while ago. The lust, the appetites of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, how things look to us, they appeal to us. The vainglory of life, what makes me look good in the eyes of others. I don't know how many people have lost it. We usually think of sexual activities contrary to the word of God or stuff like that, but the vainglory of life. I was noticing about a week ago in reading something, it caused me to focus on it. I already knew it, but this has kind of held it up and made it brighter, I guess, for a moment. Of all of the people that are in big messes and going deeper because they want somebody to think highly of them. And they don't know how to do anything different but to make a splash in the way the world measures how great you are. Now just think about that. How many people want to say, oh, they appreciate me. How great I am. And they're doing all sorts of things. But they never think about what the Lord said, he that be greatest among you, let him be your servant. They don't see it that way. Movie stars, oh my. You see people in these immoral, ungodly movie stars, and these people, women sometimes in particular, <laughs> their eyes are standing out on stems. When if they didn't have that money, they'd be out here in a ditch somewhere up north around cut and shoot trying to get over a dope case in the morning. Not any difference. They just got the money and stuff to get over it. So that's what people don't realize is how that works. But God said through Paul by the Spirit, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And also we're to withstand him and he'll flee from us. Well, I need to be knowing about those things. I need to know about myself. People talk about psychology and most all of it's like philosophy. It's worthless. But God made us as we are. And he accommodated his word to the way he made us. So if there ever is anybody that has something to say about psychology, <laughs> God does. The way we're put together. He even talks about how we can be of a sound mind. Now, let me ask you something. Are there anybody in this world, are, are there people in this world trying to be of sound mind? 
and they're conscious of their situation. They wouldn't do about it because they don't know God. They don't know the Bible. And they just go deeper into it because they don't want to know. When you look at the situation with Eve, how did she get separated from God? She knew the truth. She was beguiled. She was deceived. She believed and obeyed the devil's lie, and that was sin, and she separated herself from God. The devil could not have reached her except that she cooperated with him. So we flee from the devil. Well, how do you know how to flee from the devil? Do you see something that looks like the medieval view of the devil chasing at you with a pitchfork and you run from him? No. You know about philosophies that are contrary to the truth. You know about religion that's contrary to the truth. You know about the morality of the Bible. You know how Christians are to live. And when you see people trying to get you to do otherwise, you flee. You get away from it. And also, we're taught not only to do that, but we're taught to rebuke it. Jesus said, you see your brother's sin, just let him alone and ignore it. He said, no. Rebuke him. If he repent, forgive him. God's not going to forgive anybody unless they repent, the way the Bible defines it. So this is the way he was led astray, without a proper knowledge of the Bible and our willingness to always obey God, regardless of the cost to us. We're not going to recognize Satan's efforts to get us to sin, and we will fall for his lies. And we must therefore remember that when the devil takes control of one by causing that person to sin, he does not do so against that person's will. This is what Paul taught when he wrote to the church at Rome about the work of Satan to destroy us. Look what he says. Know ye not that to whom ye yield your servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether to sin unto death or separation, or obedience under righteousness, Romans 6.16. You can't be righteous and not obey the truth. It's impossibility. Jesus taught, therefore, for our benefit, for ourselves, and in dealing with others, by their fruits ye shall know them. You may not know why they came to embrace this doctrine, but you know it's contrary to the truth, and you know what they are. A person may proclaim himself long and loud as a great Christian. I love God. All this stuff. But if he's not obeying God in whatever area of their life may be, or many areas, the fruit he's bearing is a fruit of unrighteousness. He can't be led by God. He's only being led by Satan. Those who belong to Satan are those who then, by their own free will, deceived though they may be, do his bidding on earth. Are there many people like that? <laughs> well, of course there are. They far, far, far outnumber the faithful. Satan's servant may be highly respected mayors of cities, if there is such a thing, presidents of nations, prime ministers, monarchs, teachers, family members, members of the church. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Your friends, your family, and so on. But they are Satan's servants under his control and they will work by their actions and the fruit they bear to lead you away from the truth that Satan may possess you. Remember the Lord's statement to Peter? Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed. What do you mean? You won't be. You're going to make some mistakes and boy, he made some Jim Dandies. But he was of a disposition of heart to repent and turn away from them and do what's right as the Bible defines it. On the basis of one's proper study and understanding of the Bible, God through his son's gospel comes into our lives as we obedient to the same. And I, I don't know how many scriptures you could put after that. Hebrews 5, 8, 9, Hebrews 4, 12. Perfect law of liberty that we're to study and walk in. James 1, 25. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17, which we're to take. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. The power of God to save us is the gospel for which we're not to be ashamed, and so on and on you could go. 
I guess the ultimate is, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, Jesus said, hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. God has promised through the Apostle John, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode with him, John 14, 23. In other words, we know we love God when we're doing His will from the heart. You can't love God and not love the things of God. One of those things being the Word of God and the doing of it. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. If through the lust of the flesh we invite the devil into our lives by believing and obeying the lie, regardless of the form they may take or where they come from, then Satan has devoured us. He has control. The only way out of it is by our will to be persuaded by the truth of God's word, the gospel, believe it, and from the heart obey it, John 6, or rather Romans 6, 17, and 18. In either case of becoming a servant of Satan or a servant of Christ, it's by our will that we do the same. We can reject the devil, I'm glad to say, and all who are Christians have done that. All who live faithful to him have done that by their obedience to the gospel. They began as out in the world lost, believing in the truth of the gospel concerning Christ, Romans 10, 17. With such a belief that it led them to obey the truth of Acts 17, 30, the repenting of their sins. Then confessing their faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. Completing their obedience to the gospel by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. The only way Satan can cause men to sin today is getting them to believe and obey lies. Now, can he do that with you and me? Well, we're back to where Peter wrote what he wrote and why he wrote it. Are we vigilant? Do we know Satan's our adversary? Do we know he works through people and through doctrines, in their example, and in actually what they teach, to lead us away from the truth. So let us resolve that we'll be ever so cautious, and we'll close with these good words, marvelous and wonderful with these words, of the psalmist and the proverb writer, respectively. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, Psalm 119, 105. And then I like the way it's said, and it's said this way several times in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs 6, verse 23, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. If you need to become a Christian, now's the time to do it because you only have now. You don't know that you have any other time. As a child of God, if you've let Satan take a bite out of you and he's hanging on, you'll be able to examine yourself and know what to do about it, know what to give up, know what to take on, and you can repent and turn back to God. If you need to obey the gospel, come while we stand and sing.